start the proceedings. We should begin then. Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Mark Mercer. I'm the president of SAFS, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Many of you are familiar with Zoom, no doubt, uh, but for those who are not, it's best to turn your camera off and mute your microphone whenever you're not addressing the group. As well, you might want to ask others in the house not to consume much bandwidth while you're attending the session. The lecture tonight, including the discussion period, is being recorded and will be posted on the internet in the coming days. I want to acknowledge the good work of Francis Whittleson and Robert Thomas in putting together this event tonight. Robert is our Zoom master and he will moderate the discussion period. SAFS has been around for about 28 years now. The society promotes academic freedom, freedom of expression on campus, the use of academic criteria in academic decisions, and academic excellence and the health and vibrancy of the university generally. We promote academic values and the academic mission in a number of ways. SAFS sends letters to university administrators when we believe that academic freedom or the merit principle or academic uh, integrity have been violated or put at risk. Three times a year, SAFS publishes a newsletter of mainly original articles by SAFS members. And throughout each year, SAS sponsors events at which SAS themes are discussed and debated. Among those events is the annual general meeting, the 2020 installment to be held by a Zoom tomorrow, and the annual Freddy lecture this evening. SAFS is entirely member supported and member driven. We have no staff. Everything we do, we do through the voluntary efforts of members. Members are encouraged to write for the newsletter and to organize events on SAFS themes on their campuses or in their towns. Right now, SAFS has about 225 members. Most of them are academics working at Canadian universities, but also among our members are journalists, doctors, engineers, people from all walks of life. And we have members in the States and members internationally. Membership is only $25 a year, $15 for students, the unemployed, the retired. Contact me if you'd like to join or go to our website. Before I introduce Francis Widowson, who will introduce Samir, let me say a couple things about the Freddy Lecture. Officially, this is the annual Chris and John Freddy Lecture on the Contemporary University. The Chris and John Freddy Lecture on the Contemporary University. I agree that title does not sing, so we just call it the Freddy Lecture. Chris Freddy and John Freddy were instrumental in starting the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship and were among its original members. John was the second SAFS president. I'm the fifth. Chris is a retired urban studies professor at York University. John, who died in 2016, was a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. Because of their importance in the history of SAFS and because of their commitment to academic values and their support of the society, SAFS is delighted to honor Chris and John with our flagship lecture series. Samir will speak for 45 minutes or so and then answer questions and engage in discussion with audience members for maybe another 45 minutes. If in the discussion period you wish to ask a question or to offer a comment, use the text function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to let Robert Thomas know. Francis Whittleson's new book, Just Out, is Separate Bunny But Unequal, How Perilous Ideology Conceals Indigenous Dependency. Francis is currently working on a book about the baleful effects advocacy studies are having on both academic values and effective policy development. Francis is an associate professor in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University in Calgary, and she's a member of the Board of Directors for the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Francis. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and I wanted to thank Mark as well for all of his efforts that he does for the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. We were just talking about the newsletter today and Mark uh, is basically a one man show uh, with help, with some administrative help, um, you know, editing the newsletter and, and we just forget about how much work uh, that takes to be able to do that. Um, as Mark said, my name is Frances Widdowson. I'm a professor, associate professor in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. It is my great pleasure tonight uh, to introduce Samir Gandesha. Um, Samir is, a, is the director of the Institute for the Humanities at Simon Fraser University. 
Um, he is an accomplished scholar and has written all sorts of books and articles um, that pertain to uh, the relation between politics, aesthetics, and psychoanalysis, which is a very interesting combination to be examining. I first heard about Samir's work, I guess it was in 2018, when a colleague of mine from the Canadian Political Science Association sent me an article of his in the journal Open Democracy, uh, which was published in, in March 2018. And I highly recommend that people uh, read that article because I think it is one of the foundational documents that I've seen um, which are talking about the problem that we are currently facing, and, and I notice this all the time, um, both with my work and um, also working for the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, that there's an impression within the academy that the support for free speech, open inquiry, academic, not, not so much academic freedom, but definitely freedom of expression, is somehow a right-wing type of initiative. And I'm still trying to sort this out as to how this occurred. Um, we can get into this more tomorrow. We're going to have a number of talks tomorrow, um, uh, June 6th, Saturday, June 6th, starting, I believe, at 11 o'clock Eastern. We'll, we'll explore that more. But I think Samir really, really probed into this in this article. And I've never really seen anything uh, of that character before. And I was really, really impressed by it. And therefore, um, I recommended that Samir come and speak to us uh, tonight about his views on um, the university's academic freedom, open inquiry, and he's going to be talking more um, tomorrow um, on this subject. Anyway, uh, as well, I should mention that Samir has a recent collection of essays that are coming out, uh, which are called Specters of, which is, the book is called Specters of Fascism. I'm intrigued by that title. Uh, I think this is a very, very important subject in this day and age, and, and uh, certainly ongoing events suggest that, you know, perhaps um, there's some repetition of, of historical circumstances, which is quite frightening. Um, the book is published by Pluto Press. And today, tonight, in his lecture, um, Samir is going to talk about the uni university in international uh, perspective, and uh, I'm I'm, I'm very, very glad to be introducing him tonight. Thank you very much. I will now turn it over to Samir Gandesha. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak uh, here um, in this context uh, this evening um, and also tomorrow. Um, it's uh, just a great pleasure to be able to deliver the Chris and John Ferretti lecture on the Contemporary University, um, as well as the SAS keynote uh, tomorrow on the crisis of academic freedom. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mark um, and Robert, also, uh, you know, for uh, for facilitating my um, my appearance. Um, thanks, uh, in particular, Francis, for the introduction. Um, I think it's appropriate that you introduce me insofar as I think that um, our approaches might actually be very different. We might have, you know, aesthetical positions uh, on the question of uh, Indigenous uh, rights. Um, and I think that is perhaps appropriate in the context of a discussion of academic freedom. Um, in fact, I would say right now, I mean, before I go any further, that I would like to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, and indeed, um, we spent a couple of hours earlier today uh, launching the book. Um, we had a, a quite a fascinating discussion about the different aspects of um, what uh, uh, has been called endocolonialism. So fascism as a kind of self-colonization of Europe. And this was an argument put forth by M. S. Césaire in uh, his 1950 book, Discourse on Colonialism. And it's a thesis that has been taken up uh, both by Hannah Arendt in uh, Origins of Totalitarianism and Enzo Traverso in Origins of Nazi Violence. Um, so it's for fascism as a kind of self-colonization of Europe. Uh, another dimension of European fascism is the way in which Hitler um, was rather mesmerized by the idea of the westward expansion of the US Republic. 
Um, and so genocidal German fantasies were fed by, uh, let's say, you know, genocidal US and uh, North American realities. And this is documented in a book by Kackle, um, uh, published in 2011, called The American West and the Nazi East. So um, I think there's a, an interesting um, uh, dimension of disagreement there. Um, uh, before I go uh, on to, to my talk, I would also like to, to thank a couple of other people. First of all, I'd like to thank a, a couple of you know, really uh, good old friends. The first is um, Professor Charles Reeve, who was for close to seven years the president of the Faculty Association at, at OCAD University. He provided me with some very helpful uh, comments on um, a previous version of, of the talk. Of course, any errors uh, of fact or reasoning are mine alone. Um, that should uh, always go without saying, I think. But I'd also like to thank Joanne Boucher, who uh, will be speaking tomorrow, um, a friend uh, from graduate school, and uh, somebody who actually at the uh, the last Harry Crow uh, uh, Foundation conference introduced me to Mark Mercer, and uh, that's uh, uh, in in some sense as well uh, uh, why uh, I'm uh, pleased to to be appearing. Um, uh, here uh, this evening. So, uh, on to the talk. Upon familiarizing myself with some of Professor Ferretti's writings, I imagine that we, ha we would have disagreed on many substantive issues. Um, but he also strikes me as a man who would have relished robust debate and disagreement, um, which is what I'm hoping that my talks uh, both today and tomorrow spark. At the level of principle, however, I think Professor Ferretti and myself would have shared uh, um, a little bit more in common. For example, he was very concerned about the Ontario government's uh, zero tolerance for offensive speech framework in the early uh, 1990s, as was I. Um, I was a graduate student in political science at York uh, University at the time and recall wondering about the tenability of such a policy in my discipline in particular. How, I thought, could one properly discuss politics of, say, the Middle East or indeed contemporary feminism? without someone in class being offended by positions taken within it. So zero tolerance didn't seem to me um, to be uh, tenable at all. Um, the framework could be said to have anticipated uh, a more generalized equation um, of robust debate and discussion within the classroom with harm and abuse, which would then have to be in some way regulated or policed. I think this is uh, a tendency that's been identified within the university. The zero tolerance framework may be understood um, as a particularly illustrative example of what Professor Peretti calls velvet totalitarianism, by which if I understand the term correctly, is meant that the, the single-minded pursuit of equity within the university creates a climate of ideological conformity as in totalitarian regimes and is therefore inimical to academic freedom. The only difference, of course, is that in contrast to real, um, what say, you know, formerly existing totalitarianism, the punishments uh, are far less severe. And perhaps an argument could be constructed that we face a much worse version of such velvet totalitarianism today in the Canadian university. To throw some perspective on such a possible argument, I want to engage in a slightly estranging exercise of shifting our perspective uh, by placing developments in uh, the North American, particularly the Canadian University, in a larger global perspective. Such a global perspective may help us to test the thesis of velvet totalitarianism and provoke the question as to whether we are not witnessing the, re the re-emergence of a rather unvelvet totalitarianism. Moreover, perhaps the very term velvet totalitarianism could be seen as a, you know, which, which could be seen as a, a precursor to the term that's used in, with increasing frequency today of cultural Marxism, or um, what uh, Jordan Peterson calls uh, post, the postmodern neo-Marxist cult. Um, and that this idea, cultural Mar Marxism, um, might actually contribute to a, what I'm, I'm calling is calling a, you know, a real move towards um, uh, uh, a, a manifest form of totalitarianism. There's nothing really velvet about it anymore. 
The question has a certain urgency for North America, I would suggest, after the experience of the Harper government, uh, um, 2011 to 2015, as well as that of the Trump administration in the United States, which seems to have taken an even more authoritarian terms, a turn in recent days in response to the uprisings that have emerged across the country in response not only to police brutality, but also structural forms of socioeconomic inequality that have been made particularly visible uh, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, before I proceed any further, I would like to just say a few words about academic uh, freedom on the one hand and freedom of speech and expression on the other and the differences between them. These are often conflated um, uh, and I think it's important to, to think about the differences between them. I take academic freedom and freedom of speech and expression to form part of the larger cultural culture of liberal democracy that starts to come into its own with the bourgeois political revolutions of the 18th century in the United States and France. The ground for these revolutions had been previously prepared, of course, by the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment. The scientific revolution also played a key role uh, that is particularly germane to uh, both academic uh, freedom and uh, freedom, of, uh, freedom of expression. In the Islamic world, um, it should not be forgotten. There was also a distinct and rich tradition uh, of intellectual freedom and freedom of inquiry. So on to academic freedom. Academic freedom has a shorter and more uh, c concentrated history uh, than the freedom of uh, speech or expression in as much as it had not been really codified until the beginning of the 19th century with the founding of the University of Berlin, now Humboldt uh, Universität by Wilhelm von Humboldt, establishing the principles of Lern und Lehrfreiheit, uh, the freedom to uh, learn and teach. In this, North American universities were somewhat slower to follow suit, and it was only at the beginning of the 20th century that the um, AAUP formulate language and academic freedom with its declaration on principles of academic freedom and academic tenure in 1915. And um, Cott did the same uh, in the 1950s in the wake of the Harry Crow affair. The Cott statement from 2018 is in six parts, but I take the second part to be the crux. Most people here will um, uh, already know this, I'm sure, but it bears uh, repeating, I think. Academic freedom includes the right without restriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom to teach um, and discuss, freedom to carry out research and disseminate and publish the results thereof, freedom to produce and perform creative works, freedom to engage in service, freedom to express one's opinion about the institution, its administration, and the system in which one works, freedom to acquire, preserve, and provide access to documentary material in all formats, and freedom to participate in professional and representative academic bodies. Academic freedom always entails freedom from institutional censorship. This past spring, scholars at the University of Erlangen and Nuremberg released a global academic freedom index based on seven distinct and measurable indicators. One, freedom to teach and research. Two, freedom for academic exchange and dissemination. Three, institutional autonomy. Four, campus integrity. Five, freedom of academic and cultural ex expression. Six, constitutional protection for academic freedom. And seven, uh, international legal pr protection of academic freedom under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Finally, because it is truly a global index, it measures the existence of universities as such, which also must imply as well university closures or indeed expulsions. Along with the um, AAUP and COT definitions of academic freedom I mentioned, um, this global index helps us to gain a picture not just of what academic freedom consists of, but the larger political, legal, and institutional landscape of academic freedom uh, around the world. We also see the way in which these aspects of academic freedom, as they are institutionally embedded, might potentially come into conflict with one another, necessitating perhaps the establishment of a hierarchy of principles. For instance, one can imagine a case in which um, indicator three, institutional autonomy, 
comes into conflict with indicator five, freedom of academic and cultural expression, if the latter is imposed externally by the state, for example. It is worthy of note that while virtually each of these indicators has been universally, uniformly on the upswing uh, during the period covered by the study, which is to say 1900 to uh, 2019, um, with the consolidation, one could say, of liberal democracy in this period, only institutional autonomy has lagged behind. It also needs to be said that since 2010, there have been some um, disturbing trends moving in the opposite direction. And I'll, sh I'll return to this um, in a few minutes. But let me just turn briefly to discuss freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a constitutionally guaranteed right in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. It is freedom of expression, one of the four fundamental freedoms in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In the former, only those forms of speech that might directly incite violence may be limited by the state, while in the latter, um, uh, uh, can only be subject to, um, quote, such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, end quote. It is worth remembering as well that freedom of speech and expression was something that is um, always uh, struggled for by progressives, liberals, socialists, and communists, um, as, as Francis alluded to, and reached a kind of symbolic crescendo um, with the counterculture, with Mario Savio and the free speech movement at the University of California at Berkeley. In contrast, conservatives from Edward, Ed, Ed, Edmund Burke onwards relied on communitarian principles based on a unitary or unified conception of the good to limit the reach of free speech because of the damage it could do uh, to traditional institutions and even to the legal rational authority of the state. Political scientists such as Samuel P. Huntington, more recently famous or infamous for his Clash of Civilizations thesis, working in the context of the Trilateral Commission, warned about the crisis of democracy. Responding to the growth of political and sorry, the growth of student uh, in peace activism, as well as the struggles of, uh, of black radicals in the 1960s, um, it argued that the rights and freedoms uh, that US liberal democracy afforded were excessive and created a distinct crisis of governability for the state. Today, it would seem left and right have changed places, as we saw a couple of years ago on the Berkeley campus, with the conservatives crusading for the right of Milo Yiannopoulos to speak freely and the left actively uh, seeking to deplatform him. And this opposition between left and right now seems to be about groups who on the one side want to censor speech and on the other those who want to extend its reach. This is often framed then in, in, in terms of arguments pro and contra speech. You're either for it or you're against it. It's as simple as that. But I'm not convinced that it is in fact so simple. While such an opposition might help to sensationalize the issue and capture the attention of readers or viewers, multiply clicks on websites and likes and retweets in social media, um, such a view, I think, produces more heat than light. And it also leads to greater public bewilderment and even hostility towards the university, which then in the long run has a negative impact on academic freedom as a whole and one could say institutional autonomy um, in particular. One perspective that invites us to understand free speech in more complex terms than merely pro or contra is that recently offered in the pages of The Atlantic uh, magazine um, by Oxford political uh, philosopher Teresa M. Um, Bajan, who argues that the real question is not that of free speech versus censorship, but rather a clash between two opposed conceptions of free speech that go back to the origins of democracy itself with the Greeks. Um, these are conceptions of uh, Isagoria and uh, Parisia, free speech in the context of a community of equals on the one hand, and then the individual's freedom to say what she likes, irrespective of the costs or consequences in speaking truth to power. What is at stake, she argues, when particular groups seek to engage in acts of deplatforming speakers perceived to command power and authority is not necessarily to close down free speech 
to core to oppose free speech as such, but rather to advance a markedly different conception of free speech, one emphasizing the condition of equal participation of all speakers, which is to say, Isagoria rather than Parisia. What she doesn't acknowledge in her otherwise fine article is the way in which the rage to deplatform is all too often directed against those who themselves identify as leftists, that is, other members of structurally excluded groups. It is, in other words, by no means clear that its effect is, in fact, the pursuit of the condition of equal speech. A recent example in the Canadian context is the deplatforming of Sky Gilbert because of his criticism of a book uh, by a trans person of color, Vivek Shraya, from the theater um, Buddies in Bad Times, that he himself founded and defended from repeated attacks from the religious right in the worst possible moments of the HIV AIDS crisis. I'll just say um, parenthetically, I appeared on a panel uh, about this uh, issue called Freedom of uh, Speech in the Arts, organized by local um, Vancouver playwright um, Carmen Aguirre. And uh, Carmen was somebody who, uh, as a teenager, fought um, in the underground against the regime of uh, Augusto Pinochet. And she has also been quite concerned from the left. Um, so the panel was actually subtitled, you know, um, Voices from the Left. Uh, she's concerned that um, what has historically been a, a, a leftist principle has been now turned into its opposite. And that's what motivated her, amongst other things, um, to organize that panel. And this, so this raises the, the familiar and vexed question of who gets to decide, who gets to speak, and on what, and who doesn't. And the answers are, are being by no means easy or straightforward. And this is a reason for deep caution, I think, against censorship. Moreover, I'm not so sure that the categorical, categorical distinctions handed down from the Greeks are as clear and distinct as Bejan suggests. For instance, it could be argued that the 19th and 20th century avant-garde, the, the Dadaist, the Surrealist Situation International, um, and other uh, um, groups within the avant-garde sought to pursue the objective of securing the condition of Isagoria uh, precisely by means of Parisia, that is, precisely by engaging in a strategy of transgression to draw attention to the senselessness of war, unjust social and, and economic inequalities, and the reduction of life to the passive consumption of spectacles. But such transgressive inter interventions are inherent to liberal democracy and often take the form of conflict between um, freedom on the side of the liberal or capitalist economy and equality on the side of democracy, which is the self-rule of the demos or people. This fuels the competing and often colliding rights claims within liberal democracy, say between the right to private property on the one hand and labor um, uh, uh, rights on the other. Um, of course, it also brings into play a um, uh, fundamental challenge to the colonial state by um, indigenous uh, claims to, uh, to sovereignty. So that goes beyond, uh, 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 rather than remaining within the democracy itself. So one can point to any number of uh, conflicts uh, between uh, uh, rights um, and, and freedoms and indeed values within liberal society. Uh, I think one of the, the, the more widely discussed cases is that of Trinity Western Law School, um, where religious freedom could be said to conflict um, with the very dignity of the person insofar as it makes enrollment conditional upon a requirement that all faculty, staff, and students sign a community covenant requiring abstinence from sexual intimacy that violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman, end quote. The importance of religious freedom has become especially clear as well in discussions of the Quebec Charter of Values, which among, among other things, um, forbids uh, public servants, including teachers, from wearing religious headgear and paraphernalia. Questions concerning the scope and limits of rights are, are of course complex and deeply vexed. Not only is there a need to balance rights and freedoms in a democratic society, as I just suggested, there's also some sense that the libertarian notion of an absolute right to free speech um, is 
nonsensical uh, at worst and self-undermining at best. Martin Jay has recently argued, um, he is the, um, the eminent uh, intellectual historian, uh, uh, he's based for a long time at uh, UC Berkeley. Martin Jay has uh, recently argued that freedom of speech is not an end in itself, but a means to pursuing various objective, subjective, intersubjective, and hermeneutic ends. So the last one has to do with um, the production and interpretation of meaning. Not only is freedom of speech and expression limited, but such freedom is itself uh, um, not uh, um, well understood as existing in uh, some kind of an original state of nature that is then subsequently limited in various ways by the state. Rather, the very condition for the possibility of individual freedom is a historically pre-existing social order and is, uh, as a result, intersubjective in nature. I don't have a right until it is structurally recognized by others, for example, through law. Absolute freedom, as Hegel argued in his critique of the French Revolution and the phenomenology of spirit, produces terror as the attempted masquerade of the particular in the guise of the universal. If one accepts the premise that the social whole and not the individual existing in isolation from others is the condition for the possibility of freedom, then the unrest unrestricted freedom of speech, insofar as it includes deeply damaging and destructive, racist, misogynist, homo, trans, uh, and transphobic speech, to name but a few, through non or misrecognition uh, of others, threatens the very freedom uh, that enables that very speech. Insofar as hateful speech acts have the capacity to undermine both the personhood of rights bearers through, as I suggested, uh, miss or non-recognition, and is, in as much as they lead to resulting conflicts, um, they ultimately undermine the freedom that makes them possible. This is so because these hateful speech acts undermine the whole, that is to say the structures of mutual recognition in the various realms of life which is the enabling condition of freedom per se. Freedom is irredeemably social and not natural. To commit oneself to free speech is to commit oneself then to its very limits. So if you're serious about free speech, you're also serious about the limits of free speech. Liberal democracy itself in its current form is a, is a product of historical struggles for inclusion by hitherto excluded groups or what my friend and colleague Ian Angus has called emergent publics. Such inclusion entails, among other things, a shift from non or misrecognition to recognition of the dignity uh, of precisely such hitherto excluded groups. The legal recognition of trades union, the personhood of women, the voting rights of indigenous people, not granted, I know, in Canada until um, 1960 federally, um, though the next election um, was 1962, which was then the year that uh, most status Indians, um, indigenous peoples could, be, could, could vote federally. There was a certain exception for indigenous servicemen uh, in World War II. So, and so forth. Uh, we can understand liberal democracy in its current form as precisely the result of historical struggles uh, to be included to be recognized um, in uh, uh, terms of um, uh, one's human dignity. And such struggles for inclusion can be seen as contributing to the conflicts between two, these two different conceptions of free speech uh, outlined by uh, Beijing that I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, Asagoria and Parisian. The principle of academic freedom, like that of free speech, is neither uh, unrestricted nor unlimited. Indeed, in the um, AAUP statement from 1940, there are several conditions placed on academic freedom, such as the adequate performance of other academic duties, as well as the importance of avoiding um, controversial topics that have no relation to their subject. Obviously, the language is vague enough. Uh, so as to be open to interpretation of administrators, faculty associations, as well as uh, professors themselves. 
One aspect of the statement uh, that I find uh, uh, somewhat troubling is the regulation of the academic in her capacity as a citizen. Our freedom as academics is also limit, limited by any number of mechanisms, uh, from department chairs vetting who gets to speak at meetings to the various vetting procedures established at journals, academic presses, granting agencies, and so on. We also, I think, have a duty of care to our students and accordingly must, to some extent, balance our academic freedom with a view to creating and maintaining a propitious learning environment for them. It's really part of the discharge of our professional responsibilities as teachers. This often gets conflated with the imperative of thinking um, of the classroom as a safe space, but I'm not convinced that these are necessarily the same thing. So just as there is no such thing as an unlimited uh, freedom of speech, there is, of course, no such thing as unlimited academic freedom. So um, academic freedom at a global level, what I wish to do and what remains of my time is to look at the state of academic freedom at a global level with a view to putting into uh, perspective the claim that there exists a free speech and academic freedom in North America. And this crisis has to do in some way with the velvet totalitarianism of equity seeking uh, groups or the equity seeking left. If we look at developments in universities outside of North America, we see an interesting picture about the political valence of the freedom of speech and academic freedom. My, my main focus, as I said, will be mainly on the latter, that is to say academic freedom. We see today the global rise of uh, authoritarian populism that is, while not the same as fascism, fascism of uh, the, the 1920s and 1930s, has a good deal in common with it. By placing the question uh, within this perspective, that is the question of whether there is a crisis of academic freedom in North America, uh, Canada in particular, it is possible to conclude that it tends to be those on the left um, uh, who outside of North America are defenders of freedom of you know, speech, expression, and academic freedom. But it's those on the right who push for greater limitations to be placed upon it. In other words, it might help to throw some, uh, throw into slightly different light um, the, re the reversal I spoke about earlier in North America. And I think then some interesting conclusions can be drawn from this, and uh, I think maybe we can take uh, those up in the, the discussion period. So as I pointed out um, in the introduction to my book, Spectres of Fascism, um, Historical, Theoretical, and International Perspectives, there are two key elements of uh, authoritarian populism, if not now um, outright fascism. Uh, and this is a response to socioeconomic crises, on one, and secondly, a categorical rejection of liberal democracy, so two. In a sense, this could be understood as the attempt to reverse the gains made by groups struggling precisely for inclusion to the conditions of equal political, economic, and social participation uh, that I previously discussed. At any rate, this is how I understand the Trumpian slogan, make America great again. Expressing skepticism shared among virtually all authoritarian populists, Russian President Vladimir Putin recently stated that perhaps liberal democracy has outlived its usefulness. Perhaps it has become obsolete. Viktor Orban in, in Hungary has spoken unabashedly about illiberal democracy. While it is crucial to dif differentiate between academic freedom and free speech for the reasons I suggest, it is possible to argue that when the liberal protection of free speech come un comes under pressure, it is likely that academic uh, freedom will uh, follow suit. Apparently there is widespread agreement with Putin's uh, proposition globally, including to some extent in Canada, which I shall come back to tomorrow. I'd like in particular though, <laughs> now in what's left of my time to talk about four countries in which academic freedom is directly under fire as part of the broader attack on, or what I called earlier, the categorical rejection of liberal democracy and its institutions. Um, and I will focus on Turkey, Brazil, India, and Hungary. Turkey. In Turkey, there was an attempted coup d'etat on July 15, 2016, undertaken by a faction of the military calling itself the Peace at Home Council, 
The faction claimed that it was led to do so because of an erosion of secularism, a decline of democratic governance, disregard for human rights, and Turkey's loss of prestige internationally. It was defeated by those elements of the Turkish military that remained loyal to the government of uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, alleged, um, uh, sorry, I have to just go read that again. It was defeated by elements of um, the Turkish military that remained loyal to the government. Um, uh, President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan alleged the coup was instigated uh, by Fethullah Gülen, a Turkish businessman and cleric based in the United States. In the aftermath, scores of Turkish academics and universities were targeted particularly harshly, according to an article um, by Human Rights Watch published on May 14, 2018. 150,000 public employees were fired in the aftermath of the coup, uh, the coup attempt, I should say, um, some 5,800 uh, of, of them academics on terrorism charges based on what the Human Rights Watch considers overbroad terror legislation and emergency uh, decrees. The absence of due process, the reprisals against family members, such as blacklisting, the targeting of student activists and protests on campus, as well as interference with research and uh, participation in conferences um, on so-called sensitive subjects, such as Kurdish rights, has, uh, according to um, Turkish faculty, students, and Human Rights Watch observers, created a climate of fear and intimidation within Turkish universities. Brazil. According to an article on the website Droit et Société, um, two Brazilian uh, law professors at the Pontifical Catholic University in Rio, um, Antonio Pele and Bethania Assi, argue that since the election of you know, Yair Bolsonaro, academic freedom in Brazil has been severely threatened. Indeed, in the run-up to the election, there were reports of police entering um, university classrooms to tear down anti-fascist anti and pro-human rights uh, posters. Now, I personally remember feeling extremely alarmed by this news upon hearing it, insofar as uh, it was only a few months um, uh, before I was due to teach um, a uh, course at the University of Sao Paulo uh, in February 2019. This is indeed alarming. The writing for Brazilian universities was already on the wall. The authors argue with Bolsonaro's speech at the UN denouncing gender ideology, corrupted socialism, and the international NGOs that supposedly threaten Brazilian sovereignty by defending indigenous rights and exaggerating the extent um, of the uh, fires that were then raging through uh, the Amazon basin. In the university, there was a definite attempt, as they put it, um, as the authors put it, to crush the political opposition. Universities in Brazil rely on a cluster of research agencies. In September 2019, the two most important agencies, NPQ uh, and CAPES, saw their budgets cut by 90%. This ended grants for researchers and scholarships for students and contributed to worsening the precarious working conditions of faculty. In addition to this, the Bolsonaro government was responsible for a 30% cut to federal universities and a massive budget freeze at the Science and Communications Ministry. Moreover, there was interference with university autonomy and the overriding of the normal and accepted procedures for appointing university presidents and a campaign that led to the elimination um, the systematic elimination of the philosophy of education of Paolo Freire um, and what is often referred to as cultural Marxism and feminism from the university. My colleague and friend, uh, Vladimir Safadle, invited Judith Butler to Brazil and she was ambushed by an angry far-right mob that proceeded to burn her in effigy. As a leading representative of so-called gender ideology, Butler was clearly the bete noire of the Brazilian far right. 
when I spoke to Safat last year during my uh, teaching uh, visit, he was making contingency plans for an exile in Paris if there was an escalation of the regime's attacks on universities and public intellectuals such as himself. There was a strategy also pursued um, uh, in the US by the alt-right and encouraged by figures such as Jordan Peterson um, to have lectures of suspect professors taped and then circulated on social media with a view to intimidation. All of the above has gone hand in glove with an aggressive privatization of Brazilian, Brazilian universities. The model of authoritarian neoliberalism does not, to say the least, bode well for academic freedom. Now let's turn to India. In India, the government of Narendra Modi was recently elected to its second uh, term of office. Modi had previously achieved some degree of success as the governor of the state of Gujarat, which has managed to achieve very high rates of growth, or had managed to achieve very high rates of growth, so much so that the combination of investment in, high, in, in the high-tech sector and neoliberal deregulation um, gained it fame as the Gujarat model. However, Modi and his BJP uh, government uh, at the national level, federal level, gained infamy for his authoritarian populist strategy of attacking minorities, such as Muslims in particular, but also the left. It has also targeted Indian universities, uh, such as the ANU and a host of uh, Muslim universities uh, that are with the state itself um, in a kind of uh, uh, lockdown and block, blackout mode in Kashmir. Kashmir, as people will know, I think uh, was recently um, unilaterally uh, annexed uh, by the Indian state in violation of the constitution. Here we can see the intersection of uh, the curtailment of free speech and expression with an increasing attack as well on academic freedom. As Indian political scientist and public intellectual, um, Ajay Gudavadi, who's based in the Center for Political Studies at JNU, uh, writes in his uh, 2019 book, India After Modi, and this is a, a bit of a long quote, so please bear with me. The second major controversy under the current regime was a crisis in the institutions of higher education, including the University of Hyderabad, Film and Television uh, Institute uh, of India, the Tata Institute uh, of Social Sciences, and the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, such institutions were considered as expressing left liberal views that were antithetical to the ethics of Hindu nationalism. They were seen as working through borrowed philosophy of the Western world that did not suit the popular communitarian ethics or Indian values. The students in these institutions felt um, that this view was an assault on their freedom to think and on the autonomy necessary for a healthy democracy. The crisis foregrounded the language of national versus anti-national, where global renowned institutions such as the JNU were declared to be the hub of anti-national activities, so end quote. Here it is worth pointing out the way in which a certain kind of post-colonial and anti-Western discourse gets mobilized against liberal democracy itself, against university autonomy, for example. Um, indeed, uh, recently Amit Shah, the BG, uh, BJP's uh, home minister, declared last October that Western ideas of human rights have no place in India. This should be deeply troubling for, those post for some post-colonial thinkers. In the run-up to the last uh, year's election, the government embarked on a witch hunt that led to the incarceration of, amongst others, the great uh, grandson-in-law of B.R. Ambedkar, who uh, was um, a Dalit scholar, uh, researcher, and also uh, a um, uh, key drafter of the Indian constitution. And this, um, th this great grandson uh, is Anand uh, Teltumde, um, and he was actually a guest of ours at the Institute uh, a few years back. Now, he was incarcerated on the grounds that he was a sympathizer with the 
Maoist group and therefore a so-called urban Naxal. So somebody who lives in the urban areas but um, uh, is in solidarity and is in some way giving uh, uh, support to uh, the uh, Maoist guerrillas who are waging war in the, in the forest of Chandigarh. Um, there are a number of others who were uh, arrested on these uh, allegations and the allegations that in, indeed they were conspiring to assassinate uh, 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 Modi. Again, the similarities with the attacks on cultural Marxism uh, is quite unmistakable. Hungary, last but not least, um, this is uh, perhaps the most interesting because the most obvious case um, that uh, uh, um, addresses the crisis of academic freedom. It also uh, uh, serendipitously um, touches on the intellectual legacy of one of the foremost champions of the open society, uh, a very important uh, philosopher of science, um, uh, Karl Popper. And it also, the case is interesting because it also in, involves to differing degrees, former uh, Canadian Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper and the one-time Prime Ministerial hopeful uh, Michael Ignatiev, who's currently president of um, the Central European University. And I'll come back and discuss this uh, in, in greater length tomorrow. But to suffice, suffice it to say that the Fidesz government led by uh, Viktor Orban has taken the country in a very right, uh, rightward direction, reducing the accountability of the executive branch via checks and balances, in particular by uh, hamstringing the uh, judicial branch. More recently, on the pretext of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, exigency, Orban has suspended indefinitely the legislative branch. Over several years, he has engaged in a concerted campaign to drive the Central European University, funded by George Soros's Open Society Foundation, out of Hungary. He recently got his wish as the CEU uh, campus is moving from Budapest to Vienna, clearly an assault on academic freedom. What we see in each case, as I have indicated, is a concerted attack on the university. The Academic Freedom Index, the Global Academic Freedom Index, indicates that since 1900, the state of academic freedom has very, very much been on the upswing, as I think I already mentioned. Um, but if you look at the figures, uh, one can also see that the, um, uh, the trend is abating. Uh, and in particular, in these four examples, you see a real reversal and a real uh, um, uh, uh, decline uh, in academic freedom. And it remains, you know, it, it must be said that um, there were tendencies pushing in this direction under the Harper government, uh, and there's no reason why this could not then reappear at some point in the future. And this is something we should discuss in the next, uh, next day, tomorrow. So why, uh, why this uh, pressure? I'm, I'm nearly finished now. Um, why this pressure on academic freedom? The university plays a key role in liberal society insofar as it produces knowledge that can benefit society as a whole as part of its productive forces. It can also, of course, as we're seeing in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, help to uh, both frame public policy responses um, to containing and mitigating uh, uh, the virus as well as uh, to discovering a vaccine uh, for the virus. The COVID-19 pandemic is it has been argued the, um, the, the crisis of climate change uh, in a microcosm and universities are uh, vitally important for understanding and also dealing with climate change mitigation. But the university is also a vital source of knowledge that when disseminated can inform citizenship, public uh, deliberation and will formation. In this it can contribute to placing limitations on the public policy objectives of states and capital. For example, extractive industries when they conflict with international agreements and law and with the obligations under, say, the Paris Agreement. The university serves, in other words, alongside of the free press and, and the judicial and legislative branches of government, at least in principle, um, to place significant constraints on the exercise of sovereign power. Just as in each case, the press has been declared uh, to be what Trump calls an enemy of the people. And this is why uh, you see the spectacle of the, the three 
CNN uh, journalists being arrested on camera in, in Minneapolis. Universities are themselves increasingly demonized and attacked. And this has to do with the fact that in each instance, there are authoritarian populist regimes that want to reduce, if not eliminate completely, the mechanisms of checks and balances provided by liberal democratic institutions to maintain some semblance of accountability on the part of the executive branch and ultimately at state sovereignty. What is especially alarming in each case is the ideological justification for reducing uh, university autonomy. In the case of Turkey, as I mentioned, the purges are a result of claims of the terroristic influences of Gulen, um, as well as academics sympathetic to the Kurdish cause. In Brazil, is the demonization of gender ideology, feminism, cultural Marxism, the blame assigned to NGOs, um, just as a previous environment minister under Harper was very exercised by um, foreign uh, uh, environmental groups interfering in pipeline projects and so on. Um, this is also um, what we see in, in, the, in the Indian case in the targeting of so-called urban Naxals, which could also be taken as an example or kind of code word for cultural Marxism. Uh, or postmodern neo, or the postmodern neo uh, uh, Marxist cult, as, as Jordan Peterson puts it. The attempt, as well in Hungary, to erase the legacy of Georg Lukács um, is part of the same constellation, as is the overt anti Semitism in the attack of uh, George Soros. I mean, the, uh, Orban won't even uh, uh, disguise his anti Semitism. Soros is a globalist, as the alt right puts it. These qualitative accounts um, of threats to academic freedom are confirmed by data compiled by the researchers who established the Academic Freedom Index. I don't have um, time, of course, to explain the methodology, but would urge you, if you're interested, to take a look at the study. I can make it available, uh, I'll point you to it. Um, but if we look at each of the four cases I discussed, the individual rankings of these countries' um, academic freedom record is uh, not flattering, to say the least. Turkey is ranked E. And show uh, 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 um, uh, from A to E, uh, with A being uh, the best and E being the worst. Um, Turkey's ranked E and, sh and has showed a marked decline in all academic freedom indicators under Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, um, which has been in power since 2003, but especially since uh, 2010, you see a, a, a real drop off. Um, Brazil garners a C. Um, I expect that to worsen. Uh, India garners D status. Uh, and along with Turkey and Brazil, shows a precipitous drop in the past uh, five or, or 10 years. Hungary is uh, currently at B. However, I would expect that with the move to expel the Central European University uh, uh, Budapest campus to uh, Vienna, it will decline uh, uh, considerably. So what can we conclude about the, the global state of academic freedom? Overall, as I've suggested, there's been a, uh, a steady uh, increase in, in uh, um, the, the, let's say, the health of academic freedom from 1900 to 2011 uh, in four of the five indicators, um, with only the most, I think, important, one of the most important indicators, because it relates to all the others, which is to say institutional autonomy lagging behind. Um, there are obvious exceptions to the trend uh, as well. Most notably, as I've suggested, academic freedom has declined since the election authoritarian uh, governments in the past decade, as we've seen in the case of Turkey, Brazil, India, um, and Hungary. So like many in this webinar, I believe that there are significant pressures uh, being placed on academic freedom in Canada. Uh, I think for some of the reasons that Ferretti, uh, Professor Ferretti um, suggests in his remarks in the 1993 framework. However, we place the Canadian context in this larger context, um, uh, and uh, pay particular attention to trends within authoritarian populist regimes uh, against academic uh, freedom, pressures placed on academic freedom, um, then maybe we, we have a slightly um, different perspective. Um, the question is, is it really the case that velvet totalitarianism threatens academic freedom and free, free speech on Canadian university campuses? Or is it perhaps the very worry about velvet totalitarianism, cultural Marxism, gender ideology that does. Uh, I think that the global view helps us to um, uh, more acutely pose this question and, and it's one that I wanna take on 
uh, directly tomorrow. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much, Samir. Um, so we've had a number of questions that are come in uh, from people. Please uh, send them to you, uh, just using the uh, the chat at the bottom of the screen, um, and uh, you can send me those questions, and I will put them in the queue, and hopefully we can get uh, to all of them. Uh, the first one to send a question was uh, Frances Witteson, and I was wondering if she could uh, could ask her her question now. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, yes, thank you, Samir. That was very dense. I'm not sure if I'm just unfamiliar. Well, getting into all the other, <laughs> it's hard enough trying to deal with the Canadian situation uh, without, uh, you know, getting into um, all the other, uh, all the other countries as well. Um, but I was going to ask a question about postmodernism and cultural Marxism and all these things that are going on and what those are and what your thoughts are on them but maybe I'll save that for tomorrow because I'm still and maybe others have this problem a little bit confused about the two kinds of free speech that you identified um, Isagoria and Parisia I believe they were called and one of them I know is the idea of equal participation um, and then the other, I'm, I'm not very clear. I wonder if that's sort of our typical understanding of free speech, which is, you know, the idea of being prevented from, you know, speaking or saying what you think is true and so on. And I don't, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I usually adopt the, the one where you're being censored, that kind of idea of free speech and you can't, you can't speak and you're being stopped from speaking. But I know that many of my colleagues have the second understanding, which is the equal participation um, idea, which is used often with this safe space argument. Um, and I should be honest, um, I have actually wanted to burn Judith Butler in uh, effigy, maybe, if I understand the, correctly, because I think that is a, um, from what I understand about the, 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 um, the arguments about trans activism now, um, people tell me that Judith Butler is the, the cause of that. And I'm wondering if the trans, if you could kind of maybe use those two ideas of free speech to, to maybe clarify what's going on with trans activism and gender ideology that you were mentioning. Does that come into it? There's two different conceptions of free speech. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, that's a, a a good question. So let me try and clarify the two um, the two conceptions uh, of of speech and try and relate that back to the kind of criticism that I was making of free speech absolutism, and then uh, talk a little bit about how this might relate to. I, I'd like to focus on on academic freedom here because there's an important case. Uh, that uh, came up and, and Judith Butler was to some extent involved in it and um, we'll see where we get and then if you want to come back with a follow-up you know I'm happy to try and answer that so uh, what I was trying to get at here is to say uh, through the um, through Beijing's framing of it that um, we really ought to think about freedoms as a result of the social context or embedded in social context as opposed to existing prior to the formation of society uh, through a contract and that society must that contract must best reflect um, the prior uh, conditions the natural conditions of freedom um, uh, in social form right I just don't think this is the right way uh, to think about it that Freedom is always embedded and therefore is always limited in, 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 in particular ways. And if we look at these two conceptions, the idea of, um, in a sense, equalizing the conditions for the possibility of, um, uh, of speech um, on the one hand versus the idea, you know, so Isagoria versus Parhesia, which is really the the idea of speaking truth to power, uh, of transgression, 
right, of challenging the status quo, um, they, they are, they're distinct, they're analytically distinct. But what I was trying to suggest as well, if we look at the, um, the experiences of the, the, the uh, 20th century avant-garde, the two often went hand in hand. Uh, and I think this is part of the confusions today. I think that queer activism in, in, historically has really been about both. It's been about transgressing what kind of normal uh, sexual mores are, right? It's being quite, you know, in your face about um, uh, one sexual orientation, one presentation of, of the body, uh, challenging. Uh, you know, uh, societal prejudices and so on, and doing it in a very performative way. That's Parisia. But there's also this sense that those who uh, are in positions of power, um, those who are recognized to have normal and normative sexual uh, um, identities and gender expressions, um, are already, in a sense, in positions of power vis-a-vis -vis who uh, don't. And so there's increasing attentiveness to this power imbalance, right? So I think this is why sometimes there are these reversals, um, moving away from the, the transgressiveness of the 50s and 60s and 70s, now to one in which there's an attempt to try and uh, address the, the inequalities uh, amongst those who would make a claim to public speech. Right? And I think that this is something that needs to be taken very seriously. But at the end of the day, it's, it, what I've seen is that there's been a lot of attempts to silence people who um, have themselves historically been excluded and marginalized. A lot of the speech codes, a lot of the policing of, of speech attempts to create safe spaces have redounded against precisely the groups that are supposed to be helped by this. And, and you know, I'll give you an a, a example of that. Uh, my daughter, who's mixed race, um, was uh, excluded from, told to leave uh, a safe space for black, indigenous, and people of color, right? Because she didn't present in these terms. However, in other contexts, if, if one engages in that kind of behavior and doesn't respect the self-identification, it, it's going to explode. It's going to be a real scandal. So I'm just trying to work through some of these, these difficulties. The example mm -hmm mention uh, that people, I'm, I'm sure some of uh, the uh, participants in the webinar will have come across is that of Rebecca Tuval, who uh, wrote uh, this article for, for Hypatia um, uh, Philosophy Journal, Feminist Philosophy Journal, and long and short of it is that she um, tried to extrapolate the logic of um, uh, uh, um, trans identities to the possibility of kind of racial identities, right? So can one self-identify otherwise in racial terms? Well, this really uh, was quite a scandal and there was something like 800 uh, academics, many powerful tenured academics who came down on this assistant professor for deigning to raise these questions, you know? And this is what a university is for, especially the discipline of philosophy. It's about, as my, my colleague Ian Angus says, it's about a love for the question. Um, and so uh, this was a, a scandal. What should have happened really was, okay, we find some issues with your argument. We're going to take those up in the next issue and we'll have a round table on this and we'll discuss it further. But the, what, it, what it landed on was that this, the very articulation of this argument constituted epistemic violence. It was violence against, uh, a form of violence against certain people. And this is very problematic. Mm. Yeah, I, I have a sense, and, and maybe I, learned, I have a sense that um, it's uh, the uh, the parisia is kind of tied to this intersectionality idea, perhaps, because you're being excluded, you're not being able to participate, and therefore, um, because of that there needs to be given more consideration to your speech than those who are, have more capacity. To, am I on the right track here or is that, is that a misinterpretation? I would see it the, the other way around. I see um, the, the, the claim to um, 
Isagoria, as, as opposed to Praresia, as being the claim to equalize the conditions of uh, participation. Okay. Thanks, I'll let other people, I'll let, uh, this is a very intense topic, I'll let other people talk. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, from uh, Steve uh, Parrott, and he will uh, ask his uh, question. Hi, th uh, thank you, Samir. Um, I'm glad that you pointed out the, um, the, the threat of the rise of right-wing populism in countries like Hungary for a threat to academic freedom. And I'm also very glad that you pointed out that historically much of the, at least in my lifetime, much of the press for free speech and academic freedom has come from marginalized voices on the left. However, um, following up on Francis's questions um, and going back to your two Greek figures, basically the idea of punching up or punching down and e equating things, I don't think I, I think I'm more in favor of you got to let it all rip. But having said that, practically speaking, what do you do when this doctrine or this principle of, of not punching down becomes so prevalent in identity politics that everybody wants to claim that they're being punched down upon. So therefore, you can't even challenge a person with male genitalia going to immigrant women's houses to have his testicles shaved of hair um, because people are afraid to be called transphobic. And you have, you have who were the kind of very marginalized people just a few years ago now being called TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists. And now they are automatically fascists. So as a practical matter, what do you do when you talk about power and the arguments keep being made about marginalized groups, but yet people are using marginalization as a tool of power in itself. The second thing is, the second point is very quickly, and I'm glad you mentioned Rebecca Tuval, um, because uh, your talk very much, although it kind of promoted the value of free speech and academic freedom, your examples were almost exclusively about how the political left has had their freedoms suppressed and about how opinions that are at least associated with the political right uh, maybe do need to be suppressed because of the this Greek position. Um, it, of course, I don't dicker with your political positions. I mean, that, those are yours to have, but it it didn't seem to be a very balanced um, uh, overview when you can only talk about Rebecca Tuvel. And in fact, there are many, many, many cases of articles being revoked and censored and people being silenced by not being in a progressive position. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me address a second worry um, first. Um, I mean, I will come back to more examples in my talk tomorrow. The talk's really meant to be, um, you know, placed side by side. They do relate uh, to one another, sort of establish a or um, a discussion uh, of um, the situation in particular. But I did mention um, the Sky Gilbert case, which I think is really uh, interesting. And it's interesting because again, like Rebecca Tuval, it's, um, it is um, happening within the same, a, uh, on the uh, side of the political spectrum. Um, it is, uh, uh, let's say, people within the left um, being themselves silenced by others who identify um, as uh, the left. Yes, does one address the, the larger uh, question um, of discussions of gender identity? I think these are are, are massive and, and, and they're fraught. Um, and I would say that perhaps the tensions and pressures surrounding these discussions right now have to do with the fact that there are, you know, I think this is exactly an example of a kind of struggle for recognition. And those struggles are, um, are particularly 
uh, intensive at, at this time. There's pushback and there's struggles to recognize um, the, uh, the uh, gen uh, trans uh, identities. Um, and the, there is a lot of, um, I think, high feelings on, on, on both sides. Practically, how does one address this? I, I think in an, in an ideal world, you would have um, discussions that would include reasonable parties on both sides to sit down and say, you know, um, what happens with those who, who make transitions, particularly um, men who, who transition, um, uh, males who transition, females who want to participate in sport. How can we address these kinds of questions in a fair and just way? I, I think that might be a really good place uh, to start. Um, but I, I would have to say this is, I think, probably one of the most issues of, um, of our times. The last thing I would say is there's much to be learned from uh, Sarah Schulman's book, which I, I'll refer to uh, tomorrow, um, uh, Conflict is Not Abuse, that, that we have to think about these conflictual engagements between different perspectives, not as inherently harmful or, 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 or violent or damaging, but rather part and parcel of living together with others who, who are not like ourselves. Uh, we have to get to that point where we can work through these conflicts in a productive way uh, and in a respectful way and not conflate conflict with abuse. So I think that would be a pragmatic starting point as well. Yes, I would, I would agree with that. I would endorse your position on that. I, I guess when Francis introduced you and, and you, didn't make, you didn't say much about it in your talk, I was hoping to get some discussion uh, that is consistent with my view about how free speech is not a left wing or a right wing value. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's important to everybody in society. But I'm afraid it still came across as a little bit political to me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, so our next, uh, the next uh, participant who will ask the question is uh, Harry. If he, um, if he is ready, Harry, no. are you coming on? Do you, do you on? mean Henry or Harry? Henry, sorry. I wasn't sure what you go by because you have you, your, your yeah, handle is hey, I, hey, Wolk, 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 So Yeah. Um, sorry, I always forget uh, for, forget that. My apologies. Uh, please, please go ahead and if everyone else can uh, mute. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, well, I must say that I disagreed with um, just many, many things uh, during the talk, and I, especially the way I would say that uh, you were saying one has free speech, but one should be careful about hate speech. But the talk started off with a comparison of the supposed Nazi expansion East with the American expansion West. As if, as if these two things were equal. Um, not only that, but of course the Nazis not only expanded East, they expanded North, South, West, and everywhere with an explicit form of genocide. And that was just 70 years, 75 years ago. Whereas of course, uh, uh, Americans arrived many years, many uh, more than a century, two centuries before. And um, I think uh, <clears throat> I think just that start, I think is really, I, don't, I really don't know what to say about that comparison. I guess that could start a long conversation, but uh, I think that's really a very, very terrible comparison to make. I think America is a leading light for democracy and freedom in the world. And the Nazis were anything but that. Um, so, uh, and then some of the other things 
that uh, came up were, it's also maybe not a question, but, but some comments about freedom of the press. So I think the US, for example, is the press is, is to almost totally biased towards the left. And yes, Trump complains about it. But then to have to make a statement that three CNN reporters were arrested in Minneapolis, what this has to do with Trump is just beyond my imagination. I mean, they were, they were involved in a riot in Minneapolis, the mayor of Minneapolis and the governor of, uh, of the state um, are told, were totally ignoring the situation. So they've got arrested for some reason, but it had nothing to do with Trump ordering any arrest or any, or any pressure on CNN. In fact, uh, the CNN building was attacked by rioters and the police protected the building. So um, I'm not sure. And, and, and another case of this is just the last few days, Senator Cotton tried to publish a, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times and the whole paper is going in revolt to try to remove what he said. If anything, the pressure is on. Yeah, maybe uh, Samir can okay. start to try to, to answer uh, your question. Thank you. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Um, you know, as I said, I, I, I welcomed, um, and I do, I will continue to welcome uh, disagreement um, and uh, debate. So quickly, um, I wasn't trying to suggest an, an equation between the United States and the Nazi regime, but I said Hitler was mesmerized by the image of the conquest um, of, uh, of the West, and this fueled his uh, fantasy of Lebensraum, and this is a this is uh, part of the scholarly uh, debate on um, uh, the uh, the nature of uh, uh, of Nazism. Um, so I just refer you to that, that that it's it's part of the historiographical discussion. Um, but I was not equating the two. Um, as far as freedom of the press is concerned. I mean, I think this is a, an important point that I suppose I framed my discussion the way I did is because there's so much isolation of free speech uh, and, and also to, some, to a lesser extent academic freedom, but certainly free speech. And there's at times a kind of re reference to the uh, First Amendment, um, but there's a cherry picking of free speech from the First Amendment. Uh, and what gets left out is is uh, freedom of the press, and it's a it's now a far right talking point, isn't it? That the uh, press is the enemy of the people. Um, uh, uh, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos uh, mused at some point that uh, you know maybe um, they should be targeted with violence. So you see a now a kind of cynical use of the, the claim to free speech and principle of free speech. So uh, that was, in a sense, part of that discussion. Did Trump tell people? Did he tell the police to 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 um, arrest the, um, uh, the these members of, of CNN? No, he did not. Has he said that the press is the enemy of uh, the people? He has said that on many occasions in many of his rallies. This creates the, the conditions within which this sort of thing is is possible. Then to sort of cherry pick free speech and say, yeah, we're for free speech, I, I think is, is cynical. It's cynical. So that, that's part of the, the discussion. Thanks. Okay, well, I really think that if anything, uh, free speech means that Trump is allowed to say and disagree with the constant barrage that the media is free to present and that they are presenting a constant barrage against them. And they are doing it. Nobody is stopping them. And he, nobody's ever saying that, they, you know, that they're going to be stopped. So again, I think you've totally turned it around. Uh, and I, I disagree strongly with, with your statement, especially to, to hint that three reporters were arrested, that this had anything to do with Trump is just typical of this twisting and totally turning things around. If anything, 90% of the media. 
Thank you. I can not do Okay. Uh, yeah. If if Samir wanted to ask any or say anything in response to that, otherwise we'll move on to the next uh, individual, which is uh, Rhoda uh, Hasman has a, a question or two. Yeah. Am I on? I've unmuted and I've and I've and yes, uh, you're, I'm, I'm we on hear video. you. You're you're on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't I don't see myself. All right, so my name is Rhoda Howard Hassan. I'm a human rights scholar and I consider myself a political radical because I believe in all human rights for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Three comments. Uh, first of all, just a small thing you said, the Nuremberg uh, academic freedom principles rely on the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Uh, probably not. They probably rely on Article 19 of the International Covenant of Civil and political rights. If they're saying otherwise, they're confused. Um, second comment, I, I, I was on the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee of the CAUT in the 19, late 1990s. And I concluded they were a very pusillanimous bunch. They were very concerned, pusillanimous. They were very concerned with freedom, with uh, procedural justice, but they had very little interest in academic freedom that I could see. At one point, a document was circulating from the Women's Committee saying that everyone in CAU should, you, CAUT should have progressive values. And I pointed out you couldn't say that if you believed in academic freedom. The precise example I used was that a Muslim professor of engineering might think that the world would be a better place if everyone was a Muslim. And he had the right to think that. He didn't have the right to go into class, obviously, and say, you must be a Muslim, but he had the right to think that. But they were trying to push progressivism. My third comment has to do with cultural Marxism, and I'm not sure who exactly is using this in what uh, context, but Marx would have rolled in his grave if he found out that this uh, political moment was called Marxist. Marx, in his, um, in his, um, comments on, on, on the Jewish question says precisely that he is opposed to particularistic claims. He does not think that the Jews should make uh, particularistic um, demands as Jews because by doing so they, re they withdrew from the community and from a common sense of citizenship. And he said this, as you know perfectly well, coming himself from a Jewish background. So um, I think it's very unfortunate that anyone should accept that this is a Marxist moment. This is a moment that disregards social class um, in favor only of political identity. Some, some people do. The um, idea of intersectionality disregards the idea that simply that all, all other things can be, when all other things are equal, yes, race is the important thing, gender is the important thing, and so on. But often social class is the important thing. Poverty is the important thing. So that's my sort of comment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I appreciate uh, um, what, you, what you have to say. Um, um, I, I'll just address the, the, the third uh, point. I think that what you articulate there is very similar to my own uh, analysis of um, of identity politics. I think intersectionality tries to look at the way in which uh, race and gender and, and other forms of oppression intersect with class, but I've argued that class is actually something categorically different from these other forms of identity insofar as those forms of identity demand a certain kind of inclusion and, re and, and, and um, recognition. Whereas Marxists argue, I argue, class should be abolished class society should be abolished. And so it's fundamentally different. One, on the one hand, you have these affirmative categories. On the other, you have a negative category. And I think this is really crucial. I, th I think the idea of cultural Marxism is inherently uh, laughable, but it is powerful as a trope. And it's there in the alt-right. You see it in Brazil, in Hungary, India, and not so much in Turkey. It's a different ideological battle there. But this is also something that uh, needs to be really t taken up and clarified. Thank you so much for your uh, comments and questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Rhoda. Uh, okay, the next person that will uh, be speaking is Joanne. Um, we did have a request that Samir um, mute himself uh, when the other individual is talking. So just uh, just if you could do that, thank you. Um, but if uh, Joanne is able to come on now, uh, we can have her. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, you don't see me though. You, you can put on your, your uh, camera if you have one. Start video. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, that's good. There, there you go. go. Thank Bye. you. So just to say, uh, thanks for the talk, Samir. Okay. Um, I just, uh, I think I understood your global examples of struggles about free speech in the universities and so forth as a counter to the notion that free speech is a right-wing sort of idea or campaign. That's how I took it. So anyways, just to say that. The other thing is I just wanted to say in terms of uh, when you talked about early in your talk, you talked about bourgeois revolutions starting in the 18th century, but let's not forget the 17th century in England and the levelers and the fight for free speech, clearly democratic radicals no question. So let's not forget them, they're heroes. The, um, and then in, connected to that, one of the uh, sort of classic texts about freedom of speech comes out of the English Revolution in the 17th century from John Milton, the Aeropagitica. And one of the things, and I just, I think one of the points that Milton makes in that pamphlet, that people just ignore or it's rarely discussed is the fact he talks about censorship because there were going to be committees censoring pamphlets and newspapers is precisely that there has to be some guy in a cubby hole reading all the things and then making the determination that they're bad so the the point is is that the actual censor is exposed to the bad ideas but somehow the censor is immune from the taint of the bad ideas. And I think that's a very powerful argument that is often ignored. And it's, uh, you know, it's quite a wonderful pamphlet apart from that. But I, I think that one little point is just dismiss. That is to say that all the people who don't like Sky Gilbert or whoever it is have determined after having read the play or his article that it's bad, but somehow they're immune from the taint of it. And then they sort of uh, wish to prevent other people from being exposed to this thing after they, as some kind of intellectual elite or political elite or sexual identity elite have determined that. And I, I actually think that's a point we do not stress enough. In any case, that, those are my comments. <laughs> Stop. So nice to see you, Joanne. Thank you very much. It's a great point. And yes, absolutely. I take um, your historical point and the reference to Milton. Um, uh, these are uh, excellent points. But also, I think this is interesting. This is uh, almost a kind of salacious enjoyment on the part of uh, the censor, who is uh, somehow in control of him or herself, um, right? Has, uh, you know, um, as in, in Plato, uh, reason uh, governs the passions and um, can then instruct others that they ought not to do this. Um, I think you're suggesting that like a single censor, but then you're also suggesting more people who who would have you know read uh, you know something offensive and on the basis of that said you know don't read this uh, and so on and exercise a kind of po police function. But I, I think that what's happening more and more is what we saw with the, um, the Rushdie fatwa in, uh, in the late 80s. And that is uh, the people out there in, the, in, in cities like Bradford in the north of England um, who were burning Rushdie in effigy and calling um, rather heatedly for his demise uh, hadn't read the book at all. I mean, it's not a book that's easily, you know, accessible and digestible, but they were told by the mullahs that they they shouldn't be doing this, or they were told by their, their local uh, leaders who probably also didn't read the book, um, that this is, um, this is harmful uh, for Islam. And I'm also interested in, in 
not just the, the let's say the consequential uh, um, dimensions of this like yeah the, the effects of this are, are harmful but but rather it, 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 something like this a book uh, an artwork and so on doesn't even have to be uh, perceived its simple existence in the world is uh, offensive and it must be destroyed and this was the case with um, the, um, the the painting uh, open casket of Emmett Till uh, by Dana Schutz and the, the, the argument um, from Hannah Block was that this thing you know it doesn't it, it simply doesn't just need to be taken out of the uh, Whitney Bionelli Bien, Bien, um, it, it needs to be taken out and and actually destroyed so I think this is where where we're at and it's it, it's um, it, it's disturbing some of these these trends thank you Hello. Uh, so, Samir, we have a question from Mark Mercer, uh, if he wanted to uh, speak. Other than that, we have nobody else uh, who has a question. So I don't know if maybe we would want one more question after Mark, if there is one. Otherwise, we're going to um, uh, wrap up uh, following uh, Mark's question. Uh, you said or at least suggested that, uh, what was it, no one... Um, no one values freedom of expression for its own sake or academic freedom for its own sake, or no one can value freedom of expression or academic freedom for its own sake. Uh, that somehow these are uh, um, e either things that, we, that, that no one does value or, or there's something that makes it impossible to value them for their own sakes. Uh, I think that's false. Uh, but a apart from that, uh, what's the significance? Um, I mean, what would it matter too much if um, we value freedom of expression and academic freedom only instrumentally, given that uh, freedom of expression and academic freedom are, um, if not crucial, at least extremely important in securing many, many things that we do value for their own sakes. Yeah, thank you. That is a really good question. Uh, it was I was drawing Martin Jay's argument, and it was about uh, free speech as being um, an instrumental value rather than an end in itself. And it was then um, indexed to different kinds of objectives that one one might pursue, um, you know, objective, subjective, intersubjective, and hermeneutic ends. And uh, in the objective uh, uh, realm, it would be the pursuit of truth. Um, and that would connect up with academic freedoms. Um, so uh, why does it matter? Because again, it's a way of contextualizing uh, free, free speech. It's a way of understanding um, academic freedom also in the context of the pursuit of truth. And indeed, uh, you, I think in the 1940 statement of, uh, of uh, AAUP, uh, there's a reference to the, you know, the common good, right? So there's always an index to something else. Um, and what that means, it's, it's de-reifying and it's de-fetishizing. So what, what that means is you, you don't make uh, act, uh, either of these principles into um, things that are simply val valued in and of themselves, that one becomes attached to them as a dog to a bone, but rather sees that they're part of a, a larger set of contexts. Uh, and the, the good of these uh, principles is itself related to, to larger societal goods. And that's then we, how we can talk about the, the different limits that, that one may place on them. But I think if we'd say no limits, then um, I think we're in, in a position where there's going to be external pressures to limit uh, in very you know, heteronymous terms. But also I, I was pointing to um, the internal contradictions that can, can arise. Surely, um, freedom of speech, uh, as, a, as a principle, um, intends its own continuance in the world, right? But if it is employed in su uh, such a way that it destroys its enabling conditions, which is those larger societal contexts through hateful and, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, racist and misogynist uh, forms of speech, then it will itself be destroyed because there's no reversion to some state of nature where it would maintain itself. You say what I'm saying. And I think that's part of the, the, the reason. You might reject it. I, I don't see what you're saying. I think that, that 
Um, I, I, I think there's a um, sort of a tissue of inferences, uh, none of which is particularly good, that, that you know, takes you to, um, let me put it this way, um, forget about whether it is valuable in its own, uh, for its own sake, uh, set that aside. Can people value it for its own sake? Yes, they can. Um, I can value that um, my, uh, my friends, that you are uh, able to say what you want uh, because you think uh, it's um, uh, useful to say or interesting or whatever, um, and, and not for these other reasons, not for reasons of uh, uh, wanting to uh, belong to a group or uh, fear that uh, you're going to be excluded from a group. So uh, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm valuing uh, the fact that you have uh, uh, freedom of expression. Now that I value it for its own sake doesn't mean that I don't value other things for their own sakes. And it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be conflicts among the many things that I value for their own sakes. And I may very well have to hierarchize uh, some of these. Um, and at any rate, uh, I, I think that um, uh, the, the, the argument you give doesn't, um, the, well, um, the, the argument against uh, valuing freedom of expression for its own sake uh, and, and, and hoping that many, many people come to value it for its own sake. I don't think the argument that, that you give uh, brings us to things like a state of nature and um, any, of, any of that. Um, it, 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 it's something that we can value for its own sake as well as uh, for uh, the, uh, the other goods that it produces. Um, and uh, it may very well come in conflict with other things that we value uh, for its own sake. It, may, uh, it might make impossible these other things. Um, in fact, I don't think it does, uh, but I mean, that, that possibility is there. Um, uh, any rate, that's uh, uh, my view. I think, I, I think you, you, um, well, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we have come to the end of the question period, and I'm just going to call on Francis uh, to wrap up the meeting for us. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Samir, for being so open. I realize that we're going to have some very interesting discussions tomorrow about all these different areas. We have quite a, a diverse uh, viewpoints that are going to be expressed, but that that's really what we want here. I really want to emphasize that, is that we're, we are trying to break open the echo chambers and, and have some kind of interaction with all these different viewpoints. And so I think that there's gonna be quite a diverse um, group of people presenting tomorrow. So for people who are unaware of this, which probably no one is, but um, we are having a series of talks tomorrow starting at 11 Eastern time. And uh, if you need the link for that, please either email me fwidowson at mtroyal.ca or Mark Mercer or Robert Thomas. Um, you can find that on the, you know, just send a message on the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarships. Um, Facebook page. Um, and so we will start off with Mark uh, giving us introductions. And then we are going to have uh, Joanne Boucher, who is going to talk about Hobbes and I believe postmodernism, which I am very uh, fascinated to find out how those two things are connected. Um, and then Stephen Parrott and me will be talking about diversity, identity, um, and equity. Uh, sorry, diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, which we've uh, called die ideology. And uh, Steve has recently written a piece in the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship newsletter. And I'm hoping uh, myself to kind of act like a Sam Harris figure and probe his thoughts and contribute my own views on the subjects to some extent. And then we are going to have Samir talk to us, I assume, about the Canadian case a little bit more, which will be great because this is kind of where we're like, it's really interesting to hear about other countries, but um, we, we are currently in the thick of the things here at, uh, in Canada. So I'm, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing his thoughts. Um, and that is all happening tomorrow. Uh, we really hope to see you uh, at, the, at these talks. And uh, thank you very much everyone for attending. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for, for hosting uh, the talk today. I really enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the discussion and, and, and debate and look forward to tomorrow. Me too.
Me too. And Joanne's uh, Mike. After all our struggles, I'm so glad Joanne that your that your microphone and all these things have been sorted out. So we're gonna be. We look like we've got all the technological stuff fixed. Um, that's great. So I'm gonna end the meeting now. Look for.